Hello to chapter 101 of Moby Dick by Herman Melville. And this chapter is titled The Decanter. Ere the English ship fades from sight, be it set down here that she hailed from London and was named after the late Samuel Anderby, merchant of that city, the original of the famous whaling house of Anderby and Sons, a house which, in my poor whaleman's opinion, comes not far behind the united royal houses of the Tudors and Bourbons in point of real historical interest. How long prior to the year of our Lord 1775 this great whaling house was in existence, my numerous fish documents do not make plain. But in that year, 1775, it fitted out the first English ships that ever regularly hunted the sperm whale, though for some score of years previous, ever since 1726, our valiant coffins and macies of Nantucket and the vineyard had in large fleets pursued the Leviathan, but only in the North and South Atlantic, not elsewhere. Be it distinctly recorded here that the Nantucketers were the first among mankind to harpoon with civilized steel the great sperm whale, and that for half a century they were the only people of the whole globe who so harpooned him. In 1778, a fine ship, the Amelia, fitted out for the express purpose and at the sole charge of the vigorous Enderby's boldly rounded Cape Horn and was the first among the nations to lower a whaleboat of any sort in the great South Sea. The voyage was a skilful and lucky one, and returning to her berth with her hold full of the precious sperm, the Amelia's example was soon followed by other ships, English and American, and thus the vast sperm whale grounds of the Pacific were thrown open. But not content with this good deed, the indefatigable house again bestirred itself, Samuel and all his sons, how many their mother only knows and under their immediate auspices and partly, I think, at their expense, the British government was induced to send the sloop of war Rattler on whaling voyage and discovery into the South Sea. Commanded by a naval post captain, the Rattler made a rattling voyage of it and did some service. How much does not appear. But this is not all. In 1819, the same house fitted out a discovery whale ship of their own to go on a tasting cruise to the remote waters of Japan. That ship, well called the Siren, made a noble experimental cruise, and it was thus that the great Japanese whaling ground first became generally known. The siren in this famous voyage was commanded by a Captain Coffin, an Nantucketer. All honour to the Enderbys, therefore, whose house, I think, exists to the present day, though doubtless the original Samuel must long ago have slipped his cable for the great South Sea of the other world. The ship named after him was worthy of the honour, being a very fast sailor and a noble craft every way. I boarded her once at midnight somewhere off the Patagonian coast and drank good flip down in the forecastle. It was a fine gam we had, and they were all trumps, every soul on board, a short life to them, and a jolly death. And that fine gam I had long, very long after old Ahab touched her planks with his ivory heel, it minds me of the noble, solid Saxon hospitality of that ship, and may my parson forget me and the devil remember me if I ever lose sight of it. Flip? Did I say we had flip? Yes. And we flipped it at the rate of ten gallons the hour, and when the squall came, for 
its squally off there by Patagonia, and all hands, visitor and all, were called to reef topsails. We were so top-heavy that we had to swing each other aloft in bowliness, and we ignorantly furled the skirts out of our jackets into the sails so that we hung there, reefed, fast in the howling gale, a warning example to all drunken tars. However, the masts did not go overboard, and by and by we scrambled down so sober that we had to pass the flip again, though the savage salt spray bust bursting down the forecastle scuttle, rather too much diluted, and pickled it for my taste. The beef was fine, though, but with body in it. They said it was bull beef, others that it was dromedary beef, but I do not know for certain how that was. They had dumplings too, small but substantial, symmetrically globular and indestructible dumplings. I fancied that you could feel them and roll them about in you after they were swallowed. If you stooped over too far forward, you risked their pitching out of you like billiard balls. The bread? But that couldn't be helped. Besides, it was an anti-scorbutic. In short, the bread contained the only fresh fare they had. But the forecastle was not very light, and it was very easy to step over into a dark corner when you ate it. But all in all, taking her from truck to helm, considering the dimensions of the cook's boilers, including his own life parchment boilers, fore and aft, I say the Samuel Enderby was a jolly ship of good fare and plenty, fine flip and strong crack fellows all, and capital from boot heels to hat band. But why was it, think ye, that the Samuel Enderby and some other English whalers I know of, not all, though, were such famous hospitable ships that passed round the beef and the bread and the can and the joke, and were not soon weary of eating and drinking and laughing? I will tell you. The abounding good cheer of these English whalers is matter for historical research. Nor have I been at all sparing of historical whale research when it has seemed needed. The English were preceded in the whale fishery by the Hollanders, Zealanders and Danes, from whom they derived many terms still extant in the fishery, and what is yet more, their fat old fashions touching plenty to eat and drink. For, as a general thing, the English merchant ship scrimped her crew, but not so the English whaler. Hence, in the English, this thing of whaling good cheer is not normal and natural, but incidental and particular, and therefore must have some special origin, which is here pointed out and will be still further eludicated. No, elucidated. During my researches in the Leviathanic histories, I stumbled upon an ancient Dutch volume which, by the musty, wailing smell of it, I knew must be about whalers. The title was Dan Koopman, wherefore I concluded that this must be the invaluable memoirs of some Amsterdam cooper in the fishery as every whale ship must carry its cooper. I was reinforced in this opinion by seeing that it was the production of one Fitzwackhammer. But my friend Dr. Snod had a very learned man, professor of low Dutch and high German in the College of Santa Claus and St. Potts, to whom I handed the work for translation, giving him a box of sperm candles for his trouble. This same Dr. Snod had, so soon as he spied the book, assured me that Dan Koopman did not mean the cooper, but the merchant. In short, this ancient and learned low, but low Dutch book treated of the commerce of Holland, and among other subjects contained a very interesting account of its whale fishery, and in this chapter it was headed Smear or Fat 
that I found a long detailed list of the outfits for the larders and sailors of 180 sail of Dutch whalemen, from which list, as translated by Dr. Snodhead, I transcribe the following. 800, no, 48,400 pounds of beef, 60,000 pounds Friesland pork, 150,000 pounds of stockfish, 550,000 pounds of biscuit, 72,000 pounds of soft bread, 2,800 firkins of butter, 20,000 pounds of Texel and Leyden cheese, 144,000 pounds cheese, probably an inferior article, 550 anchors of Geneva, 10,800 barrels of beer. Most statistical tables are parchingly dry in the reading, not, not so in the present case, however, where the reader is flooded with whole pipes, barrels, quarts and gills of good gin and good cheer. At the time, I devoted three days to the studious digesting of all this beer, beef and bread during which many profound thoughts were incidentally suggested to me, capable of a transcendental and platonic application, and furthermore I compiled supplementary tables of my own touching the probable quantity of stockfish and consumed by every low Dutch harponier in that ancient Greenland and Spitsbergen whale fishery. In the first place, the amount of butter and texel and laden cheese consumed seems amazing. I impute it, though, to their naturally unctuous natures being rendered still more unctuous by the nature of their vocation and especially by their pursuing their game and those frigid polar seas, on the very coasts of that Eskimo country, where the convivial natives pledge each other in bumpers of train oil. The quantity of the beer, too, is very large, 10,800 barrels. Now, as those polar fisheries could only be prosecuted in the short summer of that climate so that the whole cruise of one of these Dutch whalemen, including the short voyage to and from the Spitsbergen Sea, did not much exceed three months, say, and reckoning thirty men to each of their fleet of 180 sail, we have 5,400 low Dutch seamen in all. Therefore, I say, we have precisely two barrels of beer per man for a twelve weeks allowance, exclusive of his fair proportion of that 550 anchors of gin. Now, whether these gin and beer harponeers, so fuddled as one might fancy them to have been, were the right sort of men to stand up in a boat's head and take good aim at flying whales, this would seem somewhat improbable. Yet they did aim at them and hit them too. But this was very far north, be it remembered where beer agrees well with the constitution upon the equator in our southern fishery. Beer would be apt to make the harponeer sleepy at the masthead and boozy in his boat and grievous loss might ensue to Nantucket and New Bedford. But no more. Enough has been said to show that the old Dutch whalers of two or three centuries ago were high livers, and that the English whalers have not neglected so excellent an example. For, say, they, when cruising in an empty ship, if you can get nothing better out of the world, get a good dinner out of it, at least, and this empties the decanter. So that was chapter 101. Bye-bye. Till next time with chapter 102. A bower in the Arsacides.